Mrs. Berner, if you're ready, we'll do a call to order and the roll call. Mayor Cook. Yes. Councilman Grimm. Absent. Councilman Vaughn. Here. Councilman Shammy. Here. Councilwoman Wright. Here. Councilman Lindsay. Here. Vice Mayor Eggleston. Here. Six members present. And here comes Mr. Grimm. Oh, all right. Mr. Okay. Councilman Grimm. Here. Seven members present. All righty. And with that, Chief Trustee, would you like to do the invocation? Sure. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the day and all the many blessings. Thank you for the beautiful weather. Please be in this meeting that thy perfect will be done. Bless our first responders, our troops, and our families. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, justice for all. And we'll dispense with the rest of the uh, <coughs> agenda, getting down to other business. <coughs> the disaster policy uh, recovery policy development and discussion with the young lady from Clark County EMA. And I'll let you have the floor and then we'll get into it. Perfect. Well, thank you, Council, for having me uh, tonight. I am Michelle Clement Spitzik. I am your Clark County Emergency Management Agency Director. I've been here for about four years, first two and a half with COVID, uh, and now the other one and a half we've been starting to, to go through and update some plans and things like that. I have brought with me tonight, I believe you've all received the packet, a ton of information. So I'm going to let you um, digest that. But there are a couple things that I want to point out, and I am absolutely happy to answer any of your questions that you have along the way. So just stop me um, as you have the question. So the first thing that I brought in your packet um, is our annual report. This is something new that I started um, year two or so when I was um, director, just to, to give the public um, some information on who we are, what we do, and why we're even in existence. Um, the Ohio Revised Code says that we have to be in existence to some capacity, but we like to think that we go above and beyond what the Ohio Revised Code says that we have to do. So if you take a gander through your packet, um, you'll see that um, I have a staff of three and a half. So it's myself, the deputy director, a full-time specialist, and a part-time specialist. So we are one of the larger emergency management agencies uh, within our region. And when I talk about a region, we are eight counties um, that surround us. So we go all the way over to Dark and Preble, to um, Shelby, uh, Champaign, all, everybody around us is in our eight county region. And then we expand a little bit further um, when we talk about the association and we, we bring in um, All Glaze, Logan, and Fayette when we go um, regionally. So on the local, regional, state, federal presence, we sit on an enormous amount of committees, boards, um, teams, you name it, we try to have a presence there just so that we can have some input and bring either grant money back to the local communities or just have an overall um, say in what's happening in, in any of these um, groups. In 2023, we went over, we responded on over 20 incidents. And by that, I mean, we, you cannot compare us to the fire department. Uh, we do not respond on EMS or fire calls or things like that. What we respond on are things like train derailments, bus accidents, um, tornadoes, your larger prolonged um, incidents is what we respond to. And that's simply to provide support for whatever the um, incident commander, the fire chief, the police chief, or the local community needs, um, we're there on site to be able to provide that um, resource. We also do event support, so we support some of your events, Heritage of Flight, um, food truck rallies, 
Sometimes we'll do the ball drop, depends on how big we think it's going to be. Um, but we provide uh, planning for those events. Uh, Clark County Fair is a, a great one. We actually have a whole separate plan for that. Um, do this if this happens type plan. Um, and so we try to get as much community exposure as we can and we try to get around the entire um, county. And when I say county, it, it is the entire county. So two cities, nine townships, villages, all of that, or I'm sorry, 10 um, townships and nine villages. And so we are pretty much everywhere. And what we do for one, we typically do for, for everybody else. With that, in 2023, we had 471 training hours that was completed by EMA staff only. Um, that doesn't include what uh, fire and first responders do. That was just my staff and myself so that we can continue to stay up with the technology, the um, greatest practices, best practices, everything that's coming down the pike from the feds. Because every all of our orders, if you will, start at the federal level, they push down to the state. The state decides what they're gonna attach to all of our grants, and then that's what we have to adhere to, plus the Ohio Revised Code. So the Ohio Revised Code outlines everything that we can do, and believe it or not, it gives me authority to do nothing. It says I have all of these things to do, like have an emergency operations plan, and we have to test that annually, but it doesn't make me compel you to be there and participate. So it gets a little challenging sometimes um, because there are things that we have to do, but we have to have community participation to make those things happen. Uh, if you look over on the grants, I am very proactive uh, in writing grants. Again, I have three and a half um, full-time staff people, but we were able to bring in $323,000, $295,000 in grants just from, from my staff alone. And those range from getting uh, equipment to first responders, to paying some half of our salaries, to uh, water rescue equipment. And then the BRIC grant that you see on there for the $36,000 is the hazard mitigation plan that we'll talk about here in just a few minutes. Communications, uh, Chief Trustee has probably talked about something called link layer. Uh, we're in the process of working on that and that just think of two-factor authentication things that you have to do you can't just log in anymore you have to do the login and provide um, you know a security code or something but we have to do that to all of our radios um, in the county so that the the bad guys can't uh, take over our radio channels and that's a state mandate and so all of our community partners, all of our first responders, in some capacity have radios provided by the county. And when I say county, I mean the EMA. Um, and so we have to go and put that link layer, as they call it, on each one of those radios. So that project's coming up. We're hoping to do it by the end of this year. Um, depending if we can keep the, the tornadoes and the weather at bay, we will probably get to it by the end of the year. Uh, but if not, we will definitely get it at the beginning of 25. Uh, so when we talk about planning, we talk about emergency operations plan, and we have a countywide emergency operation plan, and within that plan there are 16 plans, and that is because we are broken down by what we call emergency support functions and community lifelines, and there are 15 emergency support functions, so each one of those, I think um, communication, energy, um, recovery, each one of those are a different plan that we have to write. But when you smush them all together, it makes our emergency operations plan for the county. So that's a whole lot of undertaking because that has to be looked at every year and it got a complete rewrite in 2022. But if that wasn't enough, we still look at all of the school emergency operations plan. Every school in the county is required to have an emergency operations plan and we help them test it annually. Um, so I think it's around 47 different uh, school emergency ops plans that we look at annually that we have to sign off on. Uh, the fire chief has to sign off on it. Uh, police have to sign off on it. Um, and it, it really is a community effort when they're writing those. And so those are just some of the plans that we do. Um, I'm not going to read this whole thing to you. You guys can read it. Um, but I do want to talk about the emergency public notification, and that's on page 16. And so emergency public notification falls under um, one of the 32 capabilities that emergency management is responsible for. And so the way that we have handled that is we have the hyperreach system. And I'm hoping that you've heard of it before. 
but that is a system that you have to opt in and your constituents have to opt into it. And you have to opt in because we can use that system for a variety of things. If we want to talk about the New Year's Eve ball drop or the Heritage Flight Festival and um, specific to New Carlisle, we can do that. And so that isn't a life-threatening emergency. And so that's why you have to opt into that system. So we don't typically send information like that. We can, we've not really done it in the past. We would do more of the water advisories or the boil advisories and things like that. Um, but because we have the ability to use that system for whatever, you have to opt into it. And that's on our website. I know Chief shared that information multiple times. Um, so that is out there. And for tornado sirens, we have 16 in the county. Um, you all have tornado sirens in, in New Carlisle and Chief sets them off or somebody from the fire department sets the tornado sirens off. And I think that that is one of the, the misnomers, at least for Clark County, right? So EMA in Clark County has nothing, zero, to do with tornado sirens other than helping get funding for them. Once we get funding, we have an MOU with that jurisdiction that says that you're responsible to maintain and operate those sirens. And so that's not the same across the state. Every county is different in how, um, whether their EMA sets off the sirens or dispatch sets off the sirens or fire department sets off the sirens. But in, in Clark County, every jurisdiction is responsible for their own sirens, when they want to set them <coughs> off, how they want to set them off, if you want to set them off for um, any time that the county is under a warning the whole county, or if you just want to do it based on the polygon from the National Weather Service, you have that option. So the tornado sirens are solely up to you on how and when they get set off. Chief can provide lots of insight and suggestions on how to do that, but I just wanted, that is a myth um, that I personally set the tornado sirens off and I don't. Um, the other thing with the hyper reach that I wanted to, to backtrack to is if you, have like a spam blocker on your phone, you're gonna miss the call. Um, if you have your notifications turned off, you're going to miss the text message. Um, and so those are things that we found out recently within the last couple storms that people are saying that they didn't get a message. They either weren't in the polygon to get the message, because that's the only time you're gonna get a warning is if you're in the polygon that the National Weather Service draws. I don't have anything to do with it. That message goes automatically, but if your notifications, spam blockers, and things are, are on, you're going to miss them. We do investigate every one of them, every complaint that we get. So if you have complaints or your constituents are complaining to you, send them to me. We go back and we get with HyperReach and we investigate each one. But a lot of times it comes down to spam blockers and, and notifications being turned off as to why the messages didn't get through. So those were the... the Two biggest things that I wanted to cover. The last thing that I want to talk about um, is the hazard mitigation plan. That is in process right now. And you collectively can appoint your city manager <laughs> to come to my meetings. And actually it's kind of required um, because at the end of the time at the end, when the hazard mitigation plan is written. Um, you will have to adopt it so that we can get our federal funding, um, should there be any federal funding. With that, you get to put into the plan any mitigation projects that you think that you might want to do. So whether it's a generator for the firehouse or the city building or the water treatment plants or um, you have flooding somewhere that we need to look at. If, it's almost endless of what you can put into this plan. Um, and so we have to have participation. So I talk about it in the annual report, but in the other packet I gave you, all the way at the back, it talks about a meeting on May 22nd at the Brinkman Center at Clark State. You are all welcome to attend. You can send one person. Um, this is where we're gonna start talking about those projects that need to be done or updated. Um, I do believe that you guys have some projects in the mitigation plan, and I apologize, I didn't bring that whole plan with me. Um, but we, we have talked to, to Mr. Bridges about that. And so there is a public session to that plan because we want the public input too. 
right? We're all elected officials, but we might not know everything that's going on in the county. And so we want the, the public to give us um, their input too of what they want to see um, included in the plan. Now, just because your projects are listed in the plan does not require you to complete any of those projects. But what it does is we just had a tornado. Our tornado in February did not qualify for FEMA. However, dark Miami and a couple other counties surrounding us, they qualify. So what that does is in the back side, so right now you see FEMA coming in for those counties to provide the disaster assistance. When all of that is said and done, what typically happens is that they, um, they being FEMA, will open up hazard mitigation money. And when that happens, any county touching a county that was affected with a presidential declaration can apply for some of these projects to get done because that money is open. Doesn't happen a whole lot, so we want to make sure that those, those um, projects are in the plan so that when that does happen and we do get federal declarations, we can go ahead and say, hey, we have a shovel-ready project. Go ahead and give us the money. And so that's why it's important. Those are five-year plans, but it doesn't um, pigeonhole you into absolutely having to do those plans. So other than that, the only thing that I have for you guys tonight is on the second packet, <laughs> these are all of the things that we're responsible for, this whole packet, <laughs> uh, and it's a lot, but I just kind of wanted to show you how, how far our reach goes, how deep um, we can go, what we're responsible for, and then once you digest this information, I am happy to come back. I'm happy to have individual meetings or I'm happy to talk about whatever questions that you have. But I just wanted to give you a high level overview of, hey, we're here. We do a lot of things that you may not know about and then answer any questions that you guys have. It's a lot. <laughs> Anybody want to start? It's tough, <laughs> it's tough, but you know, I am one of the lucky ones. Uh, they're Green County where I live, they have one person. Uh, Preble County has two, so you know, I am thankful that we have a commission that actually supports emergency management and sees the things that we do and plan for, respond to. It's tough, but we do it. You would hate to see what her calendar looks like for meetings. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Michelle, I think it's a give that it's not going to be an if, it's going to be when. Absolutely. Are we going to have a tornado strike this area? You know, I was very surprised at Lakeview. Uh, they took a, a pretty good sized hit up there. I would hate to see that happen in this city. But as we started to look at this. I think we need to get ourselves on board, get some kind of a plan set up as to what we're going to do if and when it does hit. Um, I would hope it never would, but I guess some of my questions are, let's say for example that we have a tornado hit. I'm assuming that the fire chief is probably going to be notifying you at that point, we're probably setting up churches or a designated spot for a safe haven. At that point, where are we coming from as far as cots, bedding, food, etc.? Can you enlighten me? I can. So ESF6 is mass care. And so that is, a, when I talk about those 15, 16 plans that is one of the plans and so what the county does is partners with the Red Cross and the Red Cross brings in the canteening so food and cots and things like that they'll open a shelter for us um, and they'll run the entire mass care um, section for us as long as we need them so you saw that happen up in Logan County they had a couple different uh, shelters open from churches to I think the school at one point might have been a shelter um, but I know a couple of the churches were. And so that is all included in the countywide plan. A lot of the MOUs that I have um, would go into effect if you ask. And so that's, that's, the, that's the key here, is that 
a, a tornado could come through New Carlisle, and I'm very proactive, and I'm probably up, and I probably watched it, to be real honest, because we're tracking the weather from the National Weather Service, uh, and we know it gets really bad when we have like three emails and three um, briefings <laughs> a day on that stuff. So we, we have a pretty good heads up of when things are gonna happen. We push it out to all of the fire chiefs, police chiefs, and things like that. So we're, we're prepared on the front side for all of that stuff. And really, you would just have to call and ask, ask me for help. <laughs> I, I mean, that sounds simple, right? But that's really what I'm here for. You just call and ask for help. Well, and this is why I guess I'm, I had asked for this meeting so that we've got some kind of an idea of where we're going, which way, the direction, who to respond to. Uh, go ahead, Chief. Basically, it's going to have, we have an event like that. First of all, it's going to be the event. And once we have it clear where we can actually get out and, and see where we're at, see what we're doing. Um, first person, we're going, to, we're going to be assigned a tax team off the dispatch, and that's what we're going to work off of. And then I'm going to notify her, say, okay, we're requesting uh, assistance from the EMA. And then she's going to come out, we're going to meet, we're going to sit down and say, okay, this is what, this is where we're at, this is what we need. Now, how can we do it? And uh, right now, the fire station, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Bridges talked, the fire station will, will become the command center because we are the one of the only two buildings in the city that has a jet backup generator. Um, we will we'll become the command center for, unless for some reason the, uh, the station was involved. Uh, and then we can start requesting the assets of what we need through Michelle. And Michelle's super good. If you say, hey, I need this, this, and this, she goes, okay, I'll get back with you when I got it. We I'll let you know. And with minutes she's back. Plus they have a brand new command center, mobile command center that they just purchased last year. <coughs> and should we be, I guess the word contacting the churches in order to get a contact in order to find out whether or not we can get in there in the event a disaster were to happen. And the reason I say churches, for example, if we have the north side gets hit we could utilize the churches to the south, vice versa. But I'm, I'm thinking that, in my estimation, we need to know where these people are going until we get set up with the Red Cross and whatever is coming in. Right, and, and the initials that set up is going to be is checking for injuries, triaging, see who we have injured, what, how many we send into the hospital, then the next step is finding, okay, okay, your your house is good, your or your your family's out, you're safe, okay, you stay here until we can mitigate what we need and where we're gonna to try to displace you. You know, if we're gonna to try to get Red Cross or for or a lot of families will say, Well, I got my family member I'm gonna go stay with. Um, but I yeah. will say the last couple times that we've opened a shelter for a disaster event, we've had about three people show up. Uh, and so St. Vincent de Paul will typically put them in a hotel because it's a lot of resources to keep a shelter open for three or four people. The Red Cross will do it, um, but we, I will say that Clark County as a whole is very, very resource rich. And we have great partnerships with all of those resources. They all sit on my long-term recovery committee. And so typically if I say, hey, we have two or three families that need assistance, we can get Nehemiah Foundation, so all of the churches collectively can, can adopt the family, if you will, put them in a hotel for a couple days, or you know, work through some things like that. Um, but really, you know, first priority obviously is the life safety issue and making sure that everybody is good. And then after that, um, we start with: Do we need shelters? Is there a need for shelters? Um, we have MOUs with all of the schools all of the um, schools for busing too so transportation if you need to get people from one point a to point b we have mous for that we have some mous with churches um, not many we typically let nehemiah foundation handle all of the, the faith-based organizations uh, we have you know you don't necessarily want to move people outside of new carlisle but if if we had to we have the fairgrounds we have salvation army uh, there are lots of resources, but if we want to start looking at things specifically in New Carlisle, we absolutely can do that. 
and then we would just get an MOU with them to say, hey, in the event of a disaster, you're our contact, where's our key, um, and you know, we're coming type thing. We do that with um, a couple of the schools for reunification sites. So if something bad happens at the school, where do all the kids get shipped to? Um, so it's not uncommon for my office to, to have those conversations. So well, going one step further, well, go ahead, Bill. So what I'm hearing is if we have a natural disaster here in New Carlisle, tornado, fire, whatever, the fire chief contacts you and and it doesn't have to be him. It can be any of you. You just got to tell me who you are so right. that I know who called me. Um, but it, it, yeah, typically it's but, the but, fire chief. But that to keep call. it simple, it would be the fire chief calling you because he would have first-hand knowledge. Yep. He would know what was happening, what, you know, all the particulars of the accident mm -hmm. or, the, or the conditions that maybe we would not have. Mm -hmm. He would call you. And he would tell you, I need whatever it is, and you make it happen. I For the most part. For the most part, I mean, make it happen. I mean, you call the Red Cross if you need that. <laughs> you know, if, yeah. you need, if it's going to be something long term. I forget if it's, uh, I think the Red Cross, but I don't remember. It's been years since I've dealt with them. Uh, I know they have a, uh, a trailer. Somebody has a trailer, so I'm not going to say the Red Cross. Somebody has a huge trailer that's nothing but restrooms. Uh, they also have a trailer that's laundry and stuff, so people can do their laundry. Yeah, so that would all happen way yeah. down the road. Probably I mean, it wouldn't days happen immediately, the, yeah, days but it would be into days it. into it. Yeah, know? so we would, we would call those resources in. So those are all of our non-governmental partners that come in. So it's Tide that has the um, washers and dryers right. and things like that. So we would reach back to the state, um, and that's where every, that's where, if we back up, you can handle the disaster if you want to handle the disaster, right? It's, it's your community. You are all elected officials. Everything happens locally. All of that. I'm just a resource. However, if you have um, those requests for the bigger things like that that we don't necessarily have, we don't have a laundry trailer in Clark County, we would push those up to the state. And that would go to our VOAD groups, so our volunteers active in disaster. <coughs> and they would search around through their um, web of resources and then get back to us to who comes in. So anything that gets pushed up to the state has to come through the county EMA. Mm -hmm. Other than that, you can handle everything yourself if you want to. I know you're probably, she's like, don't, don't say that. Yeah. <laughs> but I, we are a resource and we absolutely can help you. Um, if there's things like, Chief needs a backhoe for to push in a building. We would look, you know, to the service departments to cut down costs and things like that. The cost would come back to New Carlisle. Yeah, we have a backhoe. <laughs> right, and so and we have all of that stuff listed in our resource directory. So we source everything as local and governmental to governmental as possible. If we can't, then we push up to the state and get get the whatever it is that we need. Um, if we have to rent it, we'll, we can go that route too, but then that's a lot of paperwork. Right. So, but that process has to be outlined in your EOP. So I think the bottom line of, of pretty much the discussion is if we have a natural disaster or other here in New Carlisle, the fire chief is in control of that scene because of his position. Yep. Uh, the uh, sheriff's office is in control of security and, and uh, uh, looters and stuff like that mm -hmm. and basically the fire chief is in control and he makes the call to what what we need to keep it simplified that way you don't have all seven of us or all of the administration call and say hey we need all this stuff absolutely and we and may we not don't really leave know out. what we need we, we will not we will never leave you out at some <clears throat> point during the, the disaster chief and i will do what we call a briefing for um, we call you the map group because you are the elected officials, you're gonna be the ones with the money if, if that's needed. Um, and we'll pull you together and we'll give you a brief of everything that we have. We typically do that before any press releases or any press conferences are done um, so that you're fully informed before anything goes, mm -hmm. um, goes out. And, and that's what happened when the grain elevator collapsed. Uh, the uh, chief was in charge. I, I believe uh, you guys was here at, in some capacity. 
I know your trailer was here at that point. Yeah, we had the trailer for a week. Yeah, and well, the road was shut down for, I think, the week too, I believe. Yes. You know, some of the council members showed up, you know, to, to see what was going on and, and to get information. So I can't see that in another disaster or something uh, that that would not happen. Nope, that would absolutely happen, and um, depending on the location of the disaster, we have what we call essential elements of information mm -hmm. that we send out almost immediately with the, the um, just the, the facts that we have at that given moment, and that goes to all of the elected officials. We have um, a sit rep for the longer updates that we send out every so often, whatever operational period the chief would decide. Um, and so it's, it's a constant stream of communication because um, we're not going to do a press. I'm not going to stand up and do a press conference without you all <laughs> knowing the information ahead of time. Um, so the information you send out, would that be through a text or email? I can, uh, the EEIs and the sit reps typically come through email because they're larger documents. Okay. Um, but what I can do is send you a hyperreach text message that says go check your email. Um, so then we're not making seven or eight individual phone calls, or we'll task uh, <laughs> Mr. Bridges with calling each one of you. Um, and so that's, that all can be outlined in your emergency operations plan, how you want that information to flow. Um, if you are, don't, don't say anything, don't talk to me, Mr. Bridges or Tressie will talk to me, uh, that's fine too, they're your, they're your employees. Um, we just kind of organ. We try to organize the chaos, if you will, um, and we try to keep everybody um, objectively tasked with the things that need to be fixed. The biggest thing to remember is, in one of these incidents like this, a tornado or anything, <coughs> these things aren't going to happen like that. First off, is we got to first mitigate the safety issue, it, 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 treat patients, get them triaged, get them out of the way, then safety the area before anyone. Can even go into the area. That area is going to be locked down until we meet, till, till we can say, or the county engineers can say, you know, this area is safe. You know, that's where you're talking about like the churches, that type of stuff. Those things are going to come out on the back end of this of us sitting someplace up to put people if we need to. You know. Next question, Michelle. Sure. Considering the tornado has already been here, we've got everything pretty well set up. How are we doing on the cleanup? Is that something that we would throw back at you also so that you could coordinate? You can. Um, that's a loaded question <laughs> because it falls, <laughs> Sorry <back> about that. <laughs> it falls back to the local jurisdiction and here's why. Because if we don't rise to the level of a federal declaration, it doesn't enact our debris management plan. Mm -hmm. So you or somebody was part of the debris management plan um, making. And I think the rule is gone now, but we had a FEMA approved debris management plan, which we would have gotten more money back um, because we had a FEMA approved plan. I think that went out the window now, but you have a service department. So what, what we did in uh, February is we knew we didn't meet the federal declaration level. And so we worked with the townships and the villages to use their service departments. They did typical cleanup days anyways. Um, and so we just said, you know, make sure you have this out back to the curb at this time if you want it picked up, otherwise you're responsible for it. But then those are longer um, recovery aspects. And so that's where the long-term recovery committee would kind of be enacted, if you will. And that's where the Nehemiah Foundation, uh, St. Vincent de Paul, United Way, um, you name it, they're part of the committee. And what we do is we have a case manager, and if you're not able to, to clean your yard up or you know clean, clean your area or whatever, we can case management that, right? So we'll have volunteers, we have th that BOAD group that I was talking about, so American regulators have been here since February helping with the tornado cleanup. Um, they're still out doing cleanup. That's a volunteer group that comes in. They coordinate all of that. And so there's lots of different moving parts. There's no black or white answer here. It's, it's very gray and it's very fluid. And it's all dependent on the situation. Next and the most important question. Sure. 
who's going to foot the bill? <laughs> so typically the jurisdiction that had the disaster puts it up front. Um, if you have a federal declaration, that's where I come in and do all the paperwork on the back side to help you. Uh, we have to start that paperwork on the front side, so um, tracking the trucks and things like that for cleanup. We have to do that all on the front side because we're not going to remember six months down the road how many trucks went out. And it's a whole lot of paperwork. But if we think, and we will know within about 24, 48 hours if we have reached the threshold to request FEMA to come in, then we will start all of that paperwork to get you reimbursed for that. But you will have to put the bill to speak in. Anybody else got any questions? Go ahead. I'm curious how many people or homes have to be destroyed to reach that threshold. So it's destroyed, and by destroyed, it's three walls down at least. I mean, it's 25, but the caveat with that is that they have to have no insurance or a gap of 40% in the insurance. And so, again, it's not, not black and white, it's very gray. And so it's, we were at 20 in our February tornado um, of destroyed structures. And it's not what I think is destroyed or what my staff thinks is destroyed. We have a FEMA chart that says if this many walls, if this, if this, if this, it categorizes um, major, moderate, minor, affected, and destroyed. So we go through and we check it off and we, we do a damage assessment. Damage assessments are typically due to the um, state within 24 hours. Obviously, if it's not safe, we'll be communicating that back to the state partners, um, but they're, they're on the front end of it with us as well. Typically, if, I res if it's big enough for me to respond, the state is right behind me responding to Clark County too. Um, so it's, it's 25, but it, you have to have no insurance or a 40% insurance gap. So it gets tricky, yeah. <laughs> it gets tricky. Mm. And folks have to be willing to give us that information, right? So when we're out doing damage assessments and we're like, hey, we're from the government and we're here to help, you don't necessarily <laughs> always get a warm welcome. Yeah, right, it's government too. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it really is imperative for us to collect that information so that we can get the state recovery branch mm -hmm. on, on board on the front side to, to start that process. Because you saw up in Logan County, how long it took, right? So we have 30 days to submit to the, the um, state our, our damage report, but they have to get it to, so when I talk about a presidential declaration, it is a very long process. We have to do our damage assessment. We send that to the state. The state will look at it and go, I, I think you have enough. They'll request a damage assessment with FEMA then we do a partner damage assessment and that could take several weeks, it could take a month. Once FEMA says, yes, you do have enough, we believe you have enough, then we have to write a letter to the president, not me, but the state. The state has to write a letter to the president and the president has to agree that, yes, you have enough damage to qualify for a presidential declaration. And then once that happens, he sends the letter back down it takes a little bit of time. You just now saw within the last week or so, the disaster recovery centers are up and running in um, all glaze and Logan counties. And their, their tornado was back in, in March. And so it is a process to get that presidential declaration. It's not something that happens overnight. But we can give you a good idea of whether it's gonna lean that way or not. It's government, nothing moves fast. It's the federal government. <laughs> and Mr. Bridge, you had something? Yeah, yeah, um, back to the funding side of things. Um, when we had that massive windstorm, I wasn't even employed with the city. I was still waiting tables. I think it was an 08 after Hurricane Ike. There are files on the old city manager's computer about FEMA reimbursement and assistance getting for, for the cleanup side of things. Sounds like, just piggyback on what Mr. Councilman Lindsay said, it seems like it could be, I don't want to take it lightly, but uh, uh, almost uh, something, you know, whereas if we have a tornado or some natural disaster come through, council would pass a state of emergency proclamation at emergency meeting. That's gonna put us into a certain state of operation. Um, I would ask that Jake could probably draft something for us that council could pass that would waive my spending limit authority during a state of emergency. So mm -hmm. if we need to buy something that costs more than X amount of dollars, then I can just go ahead and buy it because we're under state of emergency. 
Clearly that goes away when that state of emergencies end. As the Director of Public Safety, I'm going to delegate Mr. Trustee to handle all this because that makes the absolute most sense. Mm -hmm. And then Mr. Trustee handles it from there and coordinating with the EMA. Um, I think that's the most sound proof way to get things done and use the resources that we have at the county. Um, I'm going to have to be involved for the most part to sign contract or purchase orders or something like that. Should that purchase order lead to a contract, but other than that, Mr. Trustee is more than qualified to handle the situation. And have you seen instances where the city would have to buy something in a quick manner that costs a little bit of extra money um, in these times of emergencies that would warrant that temporary? Maybe a block of uh, generators or like something. a block of generators or something like that. Yeah, but that's I mean, it, it really is dependent on the emergency. It's not uncommon. And the state of emergency thing is great to have in your emergency operations plan. That is very, very common. It's, it's a best practice so that you guys already have a, a, a step moving forward. Uh, spending too. So last year when we rewrote the county operations plan, emergency ops plan, the city of Springfield actually came under the county's plan. So you all have the opportunity as well. Um, so we can start looking at that. If, you, if that is something that you want to. What the difference is for the city and the county plan is that we outline those spending things. Who is responsible for that? Who, because even if chief tells me order five generators or five bathrooms or whatever, our first question is who authorized it and where's the PO for it? We will get it for you. Um, but we need to know those things. And so if you have that already outlined in your plan, it makes everything go so much smoother. And I'm happy to, I actually have not ever seen your emergency ops plan, so I'm happy to look at it, go over it, have multiple meetings with you, um, bring you under the county's plan. 100% up to you guys how you want to handle that. Um, the other thing that I would um, suggest is if you don't have a disaster fund within the city, to start creating one. And it's not gonna be huge right now, right? Everybody's tight for money, but every year, just keep putting a little bit of money in that disaster uh, fund. So if we notice, and we're, we copy, we're best practices from other cities, what we're doing, most, most other cities do. So in the process of switching this over, I come from a city outside of Columbus that had a strong mayor, former government. So I'm going through it and transferring it to um, actions of a strong manager, former government. One of the things I do have in here, if, if council has noticed, one of that key player administrator is our finance director to be on site to issue those POs. Um, Ms. Harris can't sign contracts or stuff like that, but she's the one issuing those POs in order for us to do purchase. So the question, who are authored it would be me and then Colleen would issue the PO. So that brings up a really good point um, because that would fall under his incident command structure. Mm -hmm. So your, you would always have your command, so that would be your chief. Um, chief flop, so finance is under there. Um, operations, planning is typically where I go, and then logistics uh, sometimes falls under planning as well because we're just doing both things. Um, if it's big enough incident, we'll, we'll move um, logistics over by itself. But um, if you are not aware and you're eager to learn, um, FEMA and National Incident Management System has incident command training. It's all online for elected officials and has a separate class for your role in a disaster as an elected official. So those are available out there um, on FEMA's website as well. What we have, just as a rough draft, I don't know if Council got to this, it's on page 10. Uh, what I drafted is, uh, departmental duties would be, mayor would be issue the proclamation, state of emergency, um, council, these are just bullet points. I'm not reading everything. Council is there to um, research, help research codes, find out what exactly we can and cannot do, just, um, and, to, and clearly go into emergency executive session should we need to go behind closed doors. And then just prefer assistance. Me um, assumes responsibility imp implementation of the disaster plan. So it's basically me would just say, "Hey, fire chief, we're under a disaster. Run accordingly." And then um, basically, I'm your PR guy. Deals with the media um, when they don't do that. Um, clerk of council would be present to help maintain communication with council and help research codes law director for legal opinions 
and then preparing emergency legislation and proclamations. We have um, Howie uh, to deal with our major insurer, deal with our liability insurance, and just assist, assist with the assessment of damage and then finance director there for uh, funding associated purchases. So even on our very vague and early draft, we're kind of looking at how each one of us would come into play. But I think another thing we need to take into account, you all are citizens of this city. So we need to have a backup plan should one of you guys, unfortunately, get hurt as well during this endeavor. So that's something too, unfortunately. I, with all the other plans I've researched, I've never seen that in there. So I think for us, we need to definitely take it into account. But all the other cities I saw in research, they didn't have, have that backup. So that typically falls under the, coop, the continuity of operation plan. Sorry, I talk <laughs> in acronyms. <laughs> That's yep. how my brain works. And we have um, one of those already. <laughs> yeah, so then that would just transfer over. And you can actually make that an annex to your emergency ops plan because ultimately it's, you're not going to enact it. It's going to be a part it. of this. Yeah, day. you're not going to enact it unless something bad happens. And then you're going to need your... Your whole thing. Well, they're not really involved in that because it's really just has to do with our operation. So our finance director lives out in Miami County, so she'll be working from home. I live down south in South Dayton, so hopefully that area won't be hit. So I'd be able to set up operations at my house. And we each have our own individual copies of the plan. Uh, ability to get on the internet should it be out. So from the operation business side of things, it sounded solid. We actually submitted that to the state auditors. Their involvement, though, as far as anything operational-wise, would just be issuing the proclamations. What if, God forbid, is Mr. Mayor Cook's house gets leveled out? And what if I don't have a quorum to even have the meeting? So those are some of the things that we really need to start with, because really the policy side of things starts with you guys. Once they do the policy, then I'm able to go and run with it. But if we don't have anyone to issue that state of emergency or issue that proclamation, how do we handle that? Just food for thought. Mr. Attorney. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, is there a case law on that? <laughs> we have to look. <laughs> yeah, but that's a very real site. I, mean, like, I was yeah. talking to Mr. Cook about, uh, Mayor Cook about this, that the city's not that wide. If we get a half mile to a wide tornado and it hits perfectly, I mean, this town could really, really take a, a, a significant hit. And it may render a lot of the people who are supposed to be in this plan not available help. It's like Russ, I, my assistant chief, uh, Chief Gallagher, mm -hmm. lives in Hewer. Um, and we've always worked always with not just this, but with everything. He knows what I know, I know what he knows. And he can pick up, right, if for some reason I can't, he can pick up and carry on without any problem. And we've already, uh, the past couple of years, we looked at things for the reasons like this. We swapped everything that we have in the far as fire department, as far as the, on the rigs, uh, cell phones that are in the rigs, that type of thing. All of our system is on the FirstNet program, which is the only federally recognized system that will guarantee us service. If tornado hits, power get knocked out, they bring in mobile towers for us. To where we can get out, we can still have Wi-Fi, we can still communicate, that type of thing. Excuse me, Chief. Who did you say brings in mobile power? Excuse me? at t Oh, at t Okay, I, I didn't... Verizon has one too, so depending on what towers you have here in the, the city, we can bring in Verizon as well. Um, we brought them up in Logan County when I responded up to Logan County um, because all of their cell phone towers got That's down. providing the towers are still standing. So these are trailers oh, that they bring okay. in. They bring yeah. okay. So okay. your typical okay. tower got taken out, then we bring in trailers, not we, but the companies bring in trailers okay. right. that act as that. Um, they bring tower. mobile tra mobile tower sites. Okay. And that happens. I want to say that happened within have, about uh, 24 hours. But there is some lead time the depending on where the trailers are coming from across the, across the country. Right. But then when they bring okay. in the mobile towers, we'll hit. Anybody else got any questions? Okay. Good. I think I feel a lot better after having spoken with you and had you here, and the fact that. I think it makes me feel a little bit more comfortable in the fact that now we know where we're going or we've got some direction. Mm -hmm. and, I'll, and I'll be very honest with you, Michelle's office is probably one of the easiest people to work with and, and like I said, she's not just an EMA. She also handles, is in our county chiefs association meetings, um, like I said, you wouldn't want to see her calendar book. Uh, but she's involved with 
just about everything in, in the county and she's very knowledgeable and very in touch with everything so we call and say hey I, can i get this or do i do you know where i can do it? yeah give me five minutes i'll call you back and i have the answer for you and she's just said and her assistant dave super guy does this can do the same i have the 20 second down me and chief are going to come visit uh, for the update what do you have like a regular meeting on that that you said earlier just for the mitigation plan or whatever what what for the mitigation plan may 22nd and then there's one in july and i can get you the date or you'll get the date on at the may 22nd one i didn't bring okay. it with me um that that plan is a five-year plan and so this is the first time that i've actually even picked it up and looked at it because i've been doing a whole lot of other stuff uh, and so it's getting a complete overhaul it's with a contractor as well um, and so once the plan is done, we will have regular meetings on it because we want to keep up to date with the projects that were submitted. So one of the things that we are trying to put in the plan is some of these um, villages and townships have a lot of uh, mobile home parks or low to moderate income areas and they don't have the structures for tornadoes. And so we mm -hmm. want to put tornado shelters in those plans to try to get funding for the tornado shelters. Um, Community block development grant is a good one for that. Um, but we will have regular meetings once that plan is done. But for now, there's two more scheduled. May 22nd, I think there's one in July. Just shoot me the email. Um, any board you want me to sit on or volunteer on, you know, I hired myself an executive assistant. She started about a month ago, so I actually have free time to actually get involved. So okay. send me what you need help with. Thank you. Yep. I'm happy to, my phone is always on, it's on 24 seven. If you guys have any calls or questions, please call. Um, it rings 24 seven, so it's nothing unusual when my phone rings. Um, but I, I'm here as the county EMA director to, to do what we can to you know, prepare and respond to unfortunate incidents in the county. If there's nothing else, Michelle, we appreciate your attendance here tonight. Thank you. And possibly putting a little bit of our fears aside so that we can work towards an immediate end to the things that we didn't know about. <laughs> so. Call anytime, have, have Mr. Bridges or trustee call, and we'll, we'll get you situated however we need to. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank and you. again, thank you very much. Very knowledgeable. Fantastic. Do you want to go into the charter review or you want to take a five minute break or what? That's on you, sir. We're good. You want a break? Yeah, Peg needs a cigarette. <laughs> take a five minute break. <laughs> and I guess we'll go ahead and work on the charter review items. All right. Um, so uh, basically what we've done here is just summarize the last council when they went through it and said this is what we want to change this is what we don't want to change um, and that's where we left off of it so we are here should council want to make any more changes should the new council members who didn't see this last time so basically mr shammy this is right if you wanted to take a look at it and suggest any changes now's your opportunity i think the remaining council members have already seen it um, we have some questions that we're supposed to have answered. I think we got most of those answered. Your council wants to know those. Our next step is to make another document that summarizes not only your changes, but also the changes submitted by the actual Charter Review Commission itself. Are we, uh, I don't want to say this, on the ballot, we don't list all of the changes. To do it right now. Are we recommending that the ballot language say, I guess, do you, the voters, go along with all the changes specified by the city council? And the ballot language Jake will develop, um, but we did want to at least get a timeline together down for you to let you know when we got to have things done in order to make the ballot. What do you got, Jake? So, general election is November 5th. The ordinance must be passed between July 8th, which is 120 days prior to November 5th, and September 6th, which is 60 days prior. So, that's the time frame there. It's when the ordinance is passed, not the effective date. So, date pass. So, either intro on the first. Let me get my calendar. I was thinking. Oh, you got it. Good. 
So we need to have this ready by the June 15th or middle June meeting? No, the, mm -hmm. the, the yeah, first, day you could, first day you could pass it would be July 15th. That's your first regular meeting at least. And then you also meet August 5th, August 19th, and September 3rd during that time frame. So I was thinking um, July 15th would be fine. To intro it? Yeah. Because we have, before. I mean, well, we, if I understand, we have between seven, eight, nine, six to pass it, mm -hmm. right? So as long as we have it passed by nine, six, we're good to go with the ballot measures. Yeah, just if there was some issue with the board of elections Election. or something that's like smart. that, we okay. had to amend it. It would nice, it'd be nice to have a little bit of a buffer. Sure. So that's why I was kind of thinking the August fifth date. That makes great sense. So seven, the fifteenth, one. Oh, because we can't do it on the eighth. So this, we have a meeting July 1. First meeting in July is on the 1st. Then we'll have a meeting on the 15th. First, second, yep, all right, you're right. Okay, so we actually intro it on the 1st then, right? You could intro it on the 1st. So I think we'd be fine with the intro on the 15th. 15th and then vote on it on August 5th? Yeah, it, it kind of depends on how long it takes to get all this together. Yeah. I was kind of thinking around two months, maybe. So are you comfortable with, again, just intro on the 715 and then vote on an 85? Is that enough time for? Yeah. Well, to, if some issue goes down, we have to call a special meeting, emergency meeting to fix something, but I think we should be good. So and that puts us in really good shape, really it does. So like I said, I don't know if Mr. Shammy or Mrs. Wright want to kind of look over there and see any changes they want to made. Um, I think the changes council made are, are good. Um, but again, this is just your changes. We haven't summarized anything that the charter review want to change. And then we have to kind of meld those together. And then the ballot language, that's probably prescribed in yeah. a way, right? I, I've looked at some examples. Um, there's no, you can, you can do a really short summary and refer to you, you can have the uh, charter amendment language posted at the polling place. Uh, some uh, municipalities have done that. Or you can just attach all of the amendments and say, do you approve the attached amendments on Exhibit A, something like that. Um, so uh, normally those ordinances will say that law director is free to work with the Board of Elections on suitable ballot language. All right, throw on another wrinkle in here. Would it be wise to uh, incorporate these changes into a mail out that we're going to do as a water bill? Um, I think any kind of notification you can get out to your citizens prior to them voting on is never going to be not beneficial. Um, in my opinion, and quite frankly, what I've seen in other ballot measures, charter amendments have a hard time passing because I think people just don't understand them or they're not aware of them. So um, I think as long as we do a good job getting it out any way, shape or form we possibly can, I think it's going to do the passing of it a favor. Um, I don't know, I know when I go to vote for something, if I don't understand it, if I don't know it, I just don't vote for it. And that's what I fear with this, because it's such a large change. There's a lot of change going on in there. We don't know what we're, what we're going to get. Another thing you could do is split this up to two different ballot measures. You don't have to put them all together. You could do them separately. Yeah. yeah. Well, my thought was uh, trying to keep the cost down was throwing a mailer out with the water bill, we already got a mailer going out. So if we were to insert something in the water bill, mm -hmm. that kind of keeps the cost down. Yeah, we're not doing the fall utility bill newsletter because we're actually going to be starting an actual newsletter. Well, that's depending on if you guys like that or not. You'll see all the new programs we're going to do at the next meeting. So I think you'll like this. I think you'll like every one of the programs we're doing, to be honest. Um, we can supply <coughs> Um, replace the that mailing with this. Um, with that, we only get maybe two pages up front and back. We have to pay extra for a third page. That's fine, but that's far significantly cheaper 
than going out and making its own separate document, doing every door direct mail and paying for all the postage that way. So at least with this, we only pay a little bit extra for the postage when it put in our utility bill, pay, as opposed to paying the whole, the whole amount. So yes, to answer your question, I don't think it's gonna harm anything. What do uh, does council think about these changes? Is there any question on any of them that you'd like to bring forth? Again, these are the changes that you got, that you council have, have just so we're on the same page, yep. Yeah. So these are all agreed on? I'm sorry. Yes. I shouldn't have said all these are agreed on mm -hmm. already. Okay. The only thing I don't recall us uh, discussing was Article 10. We had put it to discuss it at a later date, and I don't recall us ever discussing that section. You guys went through the whole thing? You had two work sessions. Yeah, but I don't think, I think we put on Article 10. Which one was Article 10? I don't see article 10 on here, I see 9 and 11. Well, you, oh yeah, you're right, because it says discuss, you're right, Mr. That's a great memory. So Mr. Bond, it says right here, discuss Section 10 at the 6 2023 meeting. And that's a whole new section they're, they're trying to get in. Did we discuss it at, this, at that June meeting? So do you guys want to look at that and discuss that at the 520 meeting? And if you're looking at the one that I emailed that has my handwritten notes on it, it's page 24. If my memory serves me correct, it was, we had brought it up and it was whether to not include it at all, or to change it, or what. We just didn't get back to discuss that, so that was the only. Does this have to do with like committees and stuff, or no? I try to ensure will help the city ensure that engagement is sustained and improved over time. Public engagement with outreach and facilitation requires specific types of expertise, <coughs> such as outreach and facilitation as equipment and measure rules make sure that. Not for you guys to decide if you guys want it in there or not. Do you want me to note to have that discussion at the next meeting so mm -hmm. council can read it and digest it? Yeah? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So Article 10. Any others you want brought up? Go ahead, Ken. Um, there was one thing I read, and I'm, I'm not finding it because I don't know where it is right now. But it was about um, citizens making their own vote. You know, like they want to bring something up, so they take it to, you know, they get enough signatures, they take it to the board and get a new ballot. Oh, that's the referendum. Referendum. Yeah. Okay, what I, it didn't say anything about bringing it to us first. No, and I just really they thought don't have to. they don't have to. I know. They don't have is to. that a law? Yeah, it's the whole point of the referendum. Yeah, the referendum right. bypasses us. It goes straight to the board of election. Actually, any, any petition goes straight to the board. Initiative it does not have to come through council. Right, but we might agree with what they're trying to pass. They wouldn't be doing a referendum if, they, if we would agree. Okay. With them. <laughs> they're, they're trying to get you out at that point. That, that's when they, they say, y'all nuts, we want to do this, so <laughs> we're going to bring it to the people. And you I don't know, depending on the meeting, hey, you might say, sign me up here, I'll sign that for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I had a bad meeting, I'll just go ahead and sign that for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just know that going to, you know, vote on something's very expensive, and if it was, they wanted some something in town that, are you we speaking might. about your chicken ordinance they, again? They, they, have, they have to pay for that. If they do, they a do have to pay for it? To oh, okay. For then that's fine. I don't, I don't care. Know about that. Yeah, I just I didn't want the I, city I to have to pay. Because well, I, I know it's to. thousands mm -hmm. of dollars. I, I wouldn't be shocked. To be honest with you, <laughs> I would not be shocked. Yeah, I wouldn't but be I don't shocked. Know the answer uh, yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if the city would have to pay mm -hmm. for the referendum. We used to pay $8,000 for the last one we put on the ballot. Unless it was on a a regular election 
and not a special election? That's what it was about, the special election. Yeah, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't have to pay for that because it already happened the election, I think. Oh, we had, we, uh, we had a special election we paid. It's With more special more election, expensive. yes. It was but like 30000 <clears> But if it's election. on the primary or the November election, I don't think we have to pay for it. it I think that it's, it's involved in the election process. I think but this was special it. election. That's what I was talking about. Yeah, special about. election we have to pay for. Mm, I think we have to pay a little bit for general elections too. Yeah, but not the whole boat. No, no, it's significantly <laughs> cheaper. Yeah, it's significantly. Cheaper. I mean, we have to pay we three, got, four thousand dollars maybe, but it's better than what was twenty or thirty thousand dollars. What was the last time we put on the ballot? Was it the health levy or fire levy? Both. Mm. So we had to pay eight thousand for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was last year. Year before last year. So that was eight thousand compared for the one we did the special one was like thirty seven thousand. Yeah. And they just reduce your property taxes allocation. That's all they do. Mm -hmm. They deduct your from the cost and then send you what you the remaining balance mm -hmm. through property taxes. Jake wanted something clarified on section article five about residency. No, that was one of the questions that count one of the council members had for Jake to clarify. Okay. All right. So, um, does that do the city of, manager residency? Yeah, that as of 2006, That's illegal. Um, you can't require residency anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you can require that they live in an in adjacent county, but um, if you jump through some extra... Yeah, you're, so you're connected, Randy. <laughs> Just making sure here I got the trial. So that went into effect in 2006, and that um, has... So you, your thoughts is to strike that whole area C out? Yeah, because uh, it's, it's not enforceable. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't violate, that statute doesn't violate the home rule. So it, it's been I would have no problem with that, striking that. Nothing well, since it's the law, we have to strike it out. It it's un unenforceable, so it, right. we have to take it out. You can ask, you can always ask. You could say you can the council ask. may request, mm -hmm. but cannot require uh, residency. Yeah. And we can ask Randy to move. He can tell us where to go. My house makes but. payments. Give me the house in the long run. You have a city manager house in New Carlisle. Yeah. Well, we could do. We, we should have kept Madison uh, School. Uh, <laughs> so. We could provide him that area down there next to the park that for his residence. Next to the park. Which park? The I'm sorry. Next to the library. Bring it on. He knows what I'm talking about. I have some very specific <coughs> requirements for my home, so That's I'll send the, you the plans. The, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say this. The vagrants. Vagrants. That's oh, why I go when I don't want to drive all. When I drive, when I drive home at night, I just go take a tent, go back there. They caught me the other day though, so I got to find a new. I'm not even going to joke about that. I'm kidding. <laughs> Anyone's Are they back in there? <laughs> uh, I don't think again. so. No, they're doing a good job keeping them out. They are. Now that they know they're there. I haven't noticed. Uh, I haven't either. You've they had, they had quite the setup, though. Quite the setup. You've been down on the bridge again? <laughs> Is there any other sections of this that you folks want to entertain or yeah. thought? Yes. Rooms. Go ahead. Section 1.02 boundaries says Jake Clarity. Mm -hmm. Clarify the boundaries. Boundaries and change. I mean, it's, you could make it something like me. Boundaries being the geographic area of the municipality to give the city the full power and authority to enlarge its corporate limits by annexation of territory or to detach territory therefrom. I don't know if that would be if that clarifies that issue enough for you. Boundaries are just your um, municipal limits. You can expand them through annexation or uh, reduce them through attachment. So it's pretty good as it is. I think so. Okay. I think so. And then right at the very beginning of the preamble, we need to leave Almighty in. Need to what? Leave Almighty in. I don't agree. Absolutely, it needs to stay in. You guys already voted to take that out? Those, that every one of these changes have been already voted by you guys, by yeah, motions. Yeah, so. 
can change it back. Now. Oh, absolutely. I'm just letting you know. I don't remember voting to take that out. Every one of these that have removed or any of these bullet points, nothing was changed without council doing because you guys had two work sessions. So you guys discussed it and you made motions on all these. Uh, <clears throat> and we need to discuss this, I think, at the next meeting and have that put back in. This is why I wanted to bring it back to you guys because I right. figured you guys would switch back on some of this stuff because consistency seems to be an issue. So that's on you guys. But this is exactly why I brought it back because I figured, I even talked to Jake, they're probably going to change some stuff even though they've already worked on it. So that's on you guys. If you guys want to set another work session for this, I wouldn't do it during a regular session, especially the 20th, which is going to be a pretty long meeting. But we don't have much time to be dragging our feet with it. Can we just discuss it now and be done with it? Sure. Can we make motions at this meeting? This is a work no. session, so we can't make motions. It's a special meeting. Doing. You legally advertise it, you're good to go. Then I move we leave Almighty in the pre preamble. Second. You know, people move to the U.S. Pilgrims came for freedom of religion. If you just make it God, that includes all religions. You leave Almighty in there, and it narrows it down to Christianity. Well, that's your take on it, but Almighty God could be uh, Allah, could be their Almighty God. And, and I think the pilgrims came here to get rid of the king, not because of her religion. <clears throat> and this is not establishing an official city religion. No, it isn't. And just because some council members do not accept the, the fact remains, God is almighty. Any other thoughts? I guess you got a motion in a second. Call for the vote. Mm, she's got to write it. I'm kind of right here. <laughs> Hold on a second. All right, so Grim was my first, Lindsay was my second, and it was to leave in the word almighty. Yes. All right. Correct, Mr. Grim? Vice Mayor Eggleston. No. Mayor... Cook. Yes. Councilman Grimm. Yes. Councilman Bond. Yes. Councilman Shammy. Yes. Councilwoman Wright. Yes. Councilman Lindsay. Absolutely, yes. All right, that motion passes six to one. The, uh, might as well just go through this whole thing on Article 1, Jake had said, had said in the charter, and I don't know if it said it, I'd have to look at the, well, we don't have one. What Jake said about the boundaries and stuff, it, it should be in the charter that our boundaries will expand from time to time with the two annexations and whatnot. That our bound and our boundaries has changed because of the two two areas up uh, north that we have annexed. So I forget the exact words he said, but if if Jake would be so kind to repeat what he said, that should should be what is in the charter uh, uh, concerning boundaries. So what I ask, said is, uh, let me ask a dumb question. I would assume that somebody could turn around and petition us to, I guess the word is, be annexed back into Bethel Township. Mm -hmm. If they present a petition to that effect, then according to this, we've now got to have a vote on that to allow them to do it. For detachment, yes. Now, the, your detachment is, is marked, is, is currently in, spelled out in your current charter. I'm almost positive on my Reddit there before. Yeah, you have to vote on the detachment. So the city itself would have to vote 
Yeah. Oh. Well. Mm. So that would probably be presented as a referendum to be removed from the city. Right. But to, <clears throat> so they would have to get whatever signatures they would need on a referendum to present to the Board of Elections to get it put on a ballot. Then the Board of Elections would notify the city if there's a referendum. And then I think we have to pay for it. Is that correct, Mr. Bridge? I'm sorry, I'm talking about something I didn't hear your question. If, if somebody does it, we just talked about it. If somebody does a referendum, then, you know, like what Bill's talking about, want to go back into the, to the uh, township from the city, they have to do a referendum, get X number of signatures, and then the city pays for that election, correct? Or if they're doing the referendum, do they have to pay for that? Might be more of an answer to a question for Jake. I don't know. I'm assuming, I'm, I, I'll have Jake look into it for a later date, but if I had to put my money in Vegas, I would say the city's gonna pay for the referendum. Yeah, I, I would think the city would have mm -hmm. to pay for that retro referendum. Also. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. One of the things I was talking to Jake about is I really want council to really look at if something currently says one thing in the chart, like boundaries is a good example. If there's not much changing with the language between what Jake just read and what it currently reads, don't mess with it. Right. Because you're going to have all these, look, if you nitpick this stuff, you're going to have 27 things on a ballot. And then people are like, no, not doing it. So really you need to pick and choose really what's the big things you, you want changes. Um, so again, so if, again, <coughs> Just spelled out a different way, but means the same thing. No sense of changing it. Right. So, are we going to list everything we're changing as an individual vote, or are we going to put the charter out there and say the charter has been amended by council? Here are the amendments. Yes or no? That's for you guys to decide. Uh, I think it should be yes or no. Them all together and can split them up. Well, I would think putting them all together would be a whole lot easier. Well, it's not about easier. What is the staff with how people get these passed? Do you get more rate of passage through individual, or do you get more rates of passage just by one swipe? Well, if I'm a voter, I don't. I would probably want to see them broken out because I may like this, I may not like that. Because really, if you put everything together, someone might like the changes you made that wants Almighty out of it. So now for, I didn't get Almighty out, so I'm voting for the whole thing. Well, I'm just using it. It's a good example. So that's, that's some, I mean, this is a strategy. It's like anything else that you're trying to win on about, it's a strategy is what it is. But and you have my recommendation take. would be individual. So I think you'll have a better rate. I think you do it by article. By article or something, That's like Article what I was One. Just thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Article One shall be changed this way. Article Two. Will yeah. Be Do you guys? And here we go with this. Do you guys want to form like a little committee to work with me and Jake on these things so we can streamline this process, and then you guys can come back and talk about this. We really don't have a lot of time to kind well, of get through it. If if we list all of these amendments or changes on the ballot. Is this not going to cost us additional? I mean, at some point in time, if these are changes you need to make for your health, the health of your city, then you, I don't want to say you can't take money to account, but at some point in time, it's, it's going to be, it is what it is. Yeah, now, these aren't going to be, it's not going to be like crazy, crazy expensive. <clears throat> but, I mean, that's just what it is. If you're trying to put a dollar amount on this, then I, think, I don't think we should do it at all. I think if you want to do it, do it right. Make sure it's right. So if not, you're nickel and diamond it. Then you're not truly really getting what you really want out of it. Yeah, we, it's another thing too. We don't have to do them all this year. <coughs> we can do some this year. We can do some next year. We can break it up. Well, I personally would much rather see it be just listed as one. In other words, do you agree with the changes, blah, 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 etc.? Is there historical data out there from other municipalities that have done it either way? I'll start looking, but I highly doubt it. I'm going to have to go through, like, I'll go through a bigger county's Board of Elections website and then kind of just take it from there. Yeah. And that's the only thing I can do, really. 
if I spend 20, 30 minutes on that, I'll get a good chunk of a little a sample size or something. Because I'm interested in knowing that too. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Chuck Montgomery and I know somewhere, I think a city in Montgomery just did one not too long ago. I think this last election cycle. Or was it Springfield? I think Springfield made that Detroit review this past cycle. I don't know if they did or not. So, but I'll get some information for you guys. You got about 23 change. That's what I was well, just Well, that's just your changes. That's just your changes. We haven't give you a list right. of what the charter review wants to change, and they want to change just about every section you have because you guys tasked your charter review. Let me remind you, this all started with the charter review to make it easier to understand for other people. So just about every one of your articles is going to be rewritten to make it a little bit more user well, friendly. Personally, so let, let us work on that final document to get to you guys as not only your changes, but also the charter review changes from the committee, which you guys already have. We just haven't put it in a single document for you. And then you can take a look at it because this is, it's, it's gonna be a lengthy pro process. And with that being said, maybe you guys look at doing this over a three year plan, you know, so it's not shoved down your citizen's throat, you know? But that's information you can <laughs> have once, you know, we'll get the rest of the stuff to you. What if we were to come up with five changes that you were to take out of this? and put them on the ballot. I, I, I personally don't think that if you're gonna put 23, 24 changes on the ballot, I don't think it's gonna pass. And I don't think every article in the, in the, in the uh, charter needs to be rewritten like the, uh, the committee did. Uh, and you know, some of them may just change words. They yeah. use the model you own, oh, Right. Well, they, um, well, we, we looked at it as a way for people with like a fourth grade education could read it and understand it. Because they do say that you should, you know, speak to all your citizens. And people can understand that. So, in my opinion, if we would change, like maybe work on one section, use their, their knowledge or their combined, because they spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of time working on good verbiage and, and just making it user friendly and, and that's real important. So if we could change, I'm with you along the same lines as five, because 23 is too many, I wouldn't even pass it. I'd be like, what the heck? I wouldn't even read it probably, you know? And I don't know. But I think if we work on getting our verbiage better, each article, you know, it's like, Jake, Article 1, Jake's going to clarify this, and so we're going to change that. Well, like somebody said, I don't know who, but do we really need to change that? Is that all that important? It's, it's probably not a critical change, and it could be set back for the, like he was saying, the three-year plan. Maybe it's going to take 10 years to get all the verbiage <coughs> changed over, and that's okay as long as it happens, in my opinion. Well, the... I understand, if I may. Go ahead. Uh, I understand what Kathy says about what they did in the in the charter review, but this charter, it, you know, if you can't understand this charter, then I don't I don't understand why you can't. You know, uh, it isn't that difficult. It doesn't use any really big words and stuff, and quite honestly. Most people in this town has more than a fourth grade education, I would think. Uh, even in eighth grade, it? even eight, pardon me. But do they, they use, use it? it? Yes. Well, that, that we can't dictate that. You know, I think if, if we probably do have people in town that that only has maybe an eighth grade or, or tenth grade education for whatever reason, they should be able to read this with an eighth eighth grade and up education. Now, if you have college degrees, you're probably not going to understand it. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I, the majority of your citizens, when they interact with your code, they're not looking at your charter. Mm -mm. They're looking at your exterior property maintenance codes. They're looking at, you know, the other stuff that really impacts their day-to-day. -day. 
Um, so just keep also keep that in mind. This Master. is more of a um, developing your department type thing, developing your financial procedures. Mm -hmm. Your common citizen doesn't. They don't know, they don't care, they don't understand it yeah, either. Like I said, they're working more towards, like I said, the the codified, the codified ones that are yeah. actually in place that govern their day to day. So um, maybe take that into account when you decide does everything need to be changed or maybe just focus on the changes that council had with the existing charter, you know, because um, I, I, I get calls all the time. We feel calls all the time. Hey, where do I find this? And it's never, oh, it's in the charter. It's usually, oh, it's in the 600s or it's in the 14s or 1200s, you know. Um, so those are the ones that, I, you know, Mr. Lindsay started working on making those more user friendly. Those are the ones that really get your day to day beef. Um, what, let's do this. What if we were to take this, digest it, bring it back to the next council meeting, and then de make a determination of whether or not you want a second work session no, Article 10. over it? My suggestion would be let's get it down to five, maybe six at the most, changes that you want to see, <coughs> and then compare our list and that way we'll get the top five or six. Go ahead, Ken. Good idea, but could we add what the charter did recommend? Because none of that's on here. And they but did make some good he, recommendations. He a, a combined yeah. thing out to it. That's fine. Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. Well, you guys already have the document. I was just going to add this to it. So I wasn't going to like make anything new. But you guys already, I, when I emailed you guys out, I'm pretty sure I gave you the changes that that I send them out to, the charter changes. Mm -hmm. So I was just going to make it one document set of two separate files, I'm sorry. If I missed looking on that. Okay. Dale, go ahead. There are 13 sections. Is that with the Article 10, Mr. Grimm, Councilman Grimm? Uh, looking at the... So 13 to 14 sections. What if we were taking... Looks like 13. Two or three at a time. Work on amending those. Put those two or three on the ballot. While we're waiting for that to happen, we can work on the next three. Mm -hmm. Put them on the ballot, say a primary in 25. It all has to be during the general. Do I? I'm almost positive it all has to be during the general election. Oh, can't. Thank you. Sorry, standard question. And then the next three in the general election at 25. Are you sure? Yeah. yeah. You can do any regular election, basically. Yeah. So, all, so these is considered a special election unless you do it the November of an odd year. But as long as you um, do it during the regular election, it's not like your typical special election. So November 25 is not a regular election? It's a regular municipal election. Municipal elections are November and odd years. So we would be able to do primaries and general elections for the next several years. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Good. I think because it, go, it has to go on the ballot between uh, the next election between 60 and 120 days after passage. If there is no scheduled election during that time period, then you have to do a special election. Mm -hmm. So as long as you do it before, <clears throat> already scheduled primaries and generals within that 60 to 120 day window you're fine. Okay. So we can have it this November, we can have one next March or May, whatever it is. And then, again, and then another one in November and then we can hit the primary and the general yep. until this is done and take out a many years. And that'll give us time to work on the others rather than so you're getting your information from work on everything all at once. And not have a special election, <laughs> no. They're all in the primaries and the general. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, we have to pay something, but not like a special election. Yeah. I mean, like he said, the special election, the last one we did was, was no, it was, uh, I 
found he said 8,000. Right, but I get you on that, but did you look at that? All right, do you want to uh, address, let's, that's a, how let's say, the, the right. three sections at the next Four council days. meeting, or do you <laughs> want to, now the work yeah, section? Yeah, we'll just do the first no. three, I think, no, at the next council meeting. I don't know, is there one that's more critical? Well, as I understand it, there's quite a bit of stuff already on next meeting. I mean, for the three, we don't want to go in order particularly, right. do we? I mean, we want to go with things that are more important. It's all important. The whole chart uh, it is important, all important, but, but... But your general population don't even read the chart. That way we don't lose track of where we are. That might be better, honestly. Yeah. So what's the pleasure? What do we have on the agenda? Do some at the next meeting? next meeting. Next meeting, you've got quite a bit on the agenda. Ooh, let's see. I don't have my notepad with me. Uh, you got BZA applications. You have one, two, three ordinances. You have boards and com boards and commission, but that's coming as a separate email. Um, your charter. Well, if that's going to be on there, so it's the second meeting of the month. They're always busy, so just load it on. Well, you've got the normal we have the departments. Yeah, but that's, those, I mean, those generally don't take that long, or manage a report. Just put it on the next meeting. Is this for council? Um, I mean, for charter? Yeah. yeah. And, and we'll, like, they've been, like we've been discussing over here while, while you're talking down there, uh, doing like three or four things for the upcoming election and then get the next three or four things or you said five or six i think the mayor said and and get them ready to go and then get some more ready for for may or march which i forget yeah it'll be may it'll be it'll be may next year well, maybe <laughs> put, maybe put, maybe, like maybe put the ones that you don't really care if they pass or not on the first round that way you get the people used to what they're doing and then do yeah, the more important ones. Yeah, thing yeah. But, but if yeah. we go in line, we don't miss anything or forget something. Yeah. Well, fair Except, enough. Except, I mean, yeah, it does. Unless you're going to keep track of that. Or you I got enough to keep track of for you guys. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so on the twenty. So as I understand it, we're going to address three sections of the charter. The four. Or five or, or six. Or five. Five. You yeah. said five or six. Well, we got. Oh, well, that was off of this list. Well, we got Article yeah. 10. We're supposed to discuss at 5:20. So we're pushing that back because we're not going. That's not in order. Article 10. So I take that off the agenda for the 20th because you guys are doing the first couple sections and just get to 10 yeah. naturally. Yeah, we take Article 10 off because we're not going to get to it Monday. It'll be a couple of months from now. So I'm taking. Am I taking it off the agenda for that night? Okay. <coughs> okay. Anything else on this charter? So we got 520. Are we doing it as, at a, a work session or no, are we doing it at council? We're on a regular meeting. Okay, gotcha. <clears throat> Can I put that on the other bit? I'm going to put that other under business. That way, if I have some administrators I want to leave, they can leave and I have to sit through all that. Mm -hmm. In this case, it might be a long meeting. Okay, under miscellaneous, we got anything? No executive session, so I guess I'll entertain the motion. Oh, to Second. Go home. I'm going to second. Take your choice. <laughs> Council, Vice Mayor Eggleston. Yes. Oh, Mayor Cook. Yes. Councilman Grimm. Yes. Councilman Bond. I'm going to question. Councilman Jimmy. Councilman Wright. Yes. Councilman Lindsay. I do not read something. Then I'll stick my 